just play first. And then in between, you have to stand up. <clears throat> yeah. Redemption Church, will you please stand and sing with us?
good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here at Redemption Church. It is good to be with you all and to, to share in fellowship. Uh, this morning, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, dovetail with a little bit of what Scott is going to be talking about and has been talking about, that being prioritizing God's word in our lives and his special revelation for how we know him. Um, I've also just been thinking about all the other different ways that we are allowed to know God, that he has revealed himself to us. And one of them that we've been appreciating a lot recently has been just the, the beauty of his creation um, and what a wonderful like month we've had uh, weather-wise and that kind of thing. Um, and so I just wanted to read a, a verse that sticks out to me in that regard. It's, it's Romans 1.20, which says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that we are without excuse. So uh, the first couple of songs today, How Great Thou Art, and a new one that we're going to learn, really reflect on God's general revelation to us, his, uh, his power, his authority, his goodness, as we see it in his creation. So this uh, next song that we're going to sing might be a new one to a lot of you, but it's actually a pretty old one. It's called This Is My Father's World. And it has one of my favorite lines in all of, you know, Christian music uh, because it starts out as a song of adoration. It's about God's creation. But then it starts to talk about, in the final verse, how we can be confident in his goodness and how he will work out his power on our behalf because of the goodness that we have seen. Uh, the, in the last verse, it says, Though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. And so we're going to sing that song. We're going to do the first verse a little bit slowed down, and I'm going to teach it to you the first time before we really dive in, just so that we can all get the hang of it together. Oh, let me ne'er forget 
That though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my Father's world. The battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied. And earth and Father's world, the battle is not done. Jesus who died shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the ways that you have revealed yourself to us and your goodness that we can trust you to work your power out in our lives no matter what we are going through. Uh, we thank you for uh, the blood of your son Jesus, which cleanses us from all of our sins. We ask that you would um, 
bless the words of Pastor Scott. Help us to uh, take something away today that helps us become more like Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Yes, you may be seated. Sorry. Good morning. So good to have you here this weekend, Memorial Day weekend. Maybe some of you have a day off on Monday, and that will be wonderful. Um, my name is Ella Maddox, and um, we're happy to have you here with us or um, watching online. And just a couple of announcements. In two weeks, uh, we have a connection dinner, and that is for um, anyone who is new or if you've been here a while but haven't had a chance to do that, you can... Um, come to the dinner and meet some of the staff and just um, meet some other people too. And it's a great way to get connected and stay plugged in. And then next week, Duval Days on Saturday, in front of Thrive Fitness, they will have um, some activities and they need some extra helping hands. And so um, because of our construction, we don't have a specific thing that we've always hosted. And so anyway, you can sign up. Both of those things can be signed up for online. And uh, so now let us read the word. It's also from Romans today, Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed any longer to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by the testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Awesome. Good, good, good. My name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here. If you've never been here, our teaching pastor, actually, regardless if you've been here or not, our teaching pastor is in Scotland. I imagine by now he is buying like a broadsword and painting his face half blue and running around like a madman. I don't know. I would be disappointed if he doesn't come back with something like that. But you can be praying for he and Ellen, who are taking a much-needed break. He will be back on June the 11th, so I would encourage you to to tune back in or visit again to make sure that you hear him teach. Um, the first thing we want to do is do our hub update for our giving. Nice, good job. Actually, big, yeah, <laughs> applaud. It actually went up a little bit in the last two days since I created that slide. So I think we're 62% there, which is awesome. And the construction continues to go really, really well. Um, if you have not downloaded our app, I would encourage you to do that. It's free, and there's notes about what we're talking about today, and there's a, a bunch of links in the notes that might help you going forward. Um, I don't know if you've, if you've spent much time with pastors, guys that teach, preach sermons. There's always this thing in the back of our mind, are we connecting, and are we, are we, are we being true to God when we're sharing? Will people retain anything that we share? And somebody this week, they were going antique shopping, and they actually sent me a picture, which was a great encouragement to my sermon last week. Let's see if we can find it. So she actually sent that. So she was actually paying attention. Donna down there was paying attention. So I got through a little bit, I guess. So we'll see how that goes. So thank you for that encouragement, Donna. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to start you out with a little exercise. By the way, if that didn't make sense, uh, listen to the sermon from last week. It'll make sense. Um, I want to ask you a question. I would act like everybody in here to get the most important person in your life, in your mind. Okay, take a moment. The most important person in your life, get that in your mind. You can't use the Sunday school answer. You can't say Jesus. But get somebody else, all right? You got that in your mind? All right, I got some good news. Whoever that is, this book the person wrote, it's, it's by them and all about them. The most important person in your life. It's like a diary, but it's much, much more than that. Here it is, written about this person, all right? It has their entire history in it, amazing things about what this person did and this person will do in the future. Imagine how valuable that book would be to you. It describes in detail this person's personality and what makes them tick, and much of it you don't know. It contains their hopes for their life and their hopes for your life with them together. Much of it directly concerns you and what this person thinks about you. How much this person loves you. 
If such a book existed and I held it in my hand, how interested would you be to read it? How often would you read it? How quickly you would read it, right? You'd probably be coming up on the stage already. It's really not. I, that, that was all pretend, okay? I'm, I don't want you to come here. Oh, I'm very disappointed. Steve, this book isn't about Steve at all. <laughs> what I'm trying to, to get us to, I, to think about is how important the Bible is because the Bible fills all those things and much more. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you... Uh, you be here in a real and vital way, helping us to discern what it is, how it is you want us to see your word. I pray that lives will be transformed by, by your word this morning. I also want to lift up all the families of those who lost people in the defense of this country this weekend. I know we kind of think about um, that we get the day off, but not really what it's about. I lift those people up. I pray that you bring comfort to them. And I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. So my, my premise here, you know, we've, we're doing this series, If Then. If we're followers of Jesus, then th certain things are true about our life. These are not requirements for our salvation. They are not works. They should be byproducts of our salvation, right? And the one today is, if we, just, we are followers of Jesus, then we should prioritize the intake of the Bible in our life. Sounds really basic. By the way, a lot of these topics seem really basic to me, and they probably do to you too, these if-thens, but... I've selected them because it's either challenges that I am going through or have gone through or somebody else who maybe has been an established Christian for a long time. So that's why we're hitting these. But you might ask by this topic, why do we need the intake of the scripture? Why? Right? What, what purpose could it serve? Well, there's a few. One is to better know God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That's a lot of that in the Bible. It allows us to know what God expects from us. It allows us to become more like Jesus. It transforms us into that like, like nothing else we can do. It keeps us on the right path. And maybe as important of, as any of those is God wrote it specifically for us, his followers. Now, I have had people say to me when I've asked them about you know, their, their habits about reading the Bible, Christians, people that are, that are following Jesus, say, I've read the Bible already. You say, well, how often do you read that? I've read it already. I don't need to read it again. Um, if that's you, I would say you're very self-assured in something that you probably shouldn't be. There are, there are people that study the Bible 40, 50, 60 years, right? Theologians who study it in depth. The Bible is so vital, so, so full of, of all kinds of topics that speak to us, history and prophecy, all these things. It would be... The height of arrogance to say, I've read it once, I got it, all right? And, and the Bible reveals itself to us over and over and over. When I read the Bible, I try every time to pray, God, bring something to me in this passage that I'd never experienced before. One of the things I love to do is to read a passage for 30 days over and over, every day. Just read a single passage, or if it's a small book, read a single book. And it's wild what, what God will reveal to us if we ask him. First Peter talks about this. He says, desire God's pure word as newborn babies desire milk. Then you will grow in your salvation. Certainly you have tasted that the Lord is good. Imagine that illustration. A baby, just, you don't feed a baby once and let him send him on his way, right? What is it, every 20 minutes? How often do babies? It's been a long time since I, it seems really regularly they need to, to bring this stuff in, right? And that's how we should be with the word, I think. I won't touch on, on how the Bible came together this morning. That's called canon, how, how we decided what books go together. Uh, Pastor Matt has preached on that in the past. You can find it in the archives, and he did a really good job. So if you're interested in that, I would encourage you to look that up. Rather, we're going to focus on how did Jesus' original followers, the, the, the guys that camped with him and, and couch surfed with him for three years, how did they see Scripture? That's what we're going to be focusing on primarily. New Testament authors quoted other New Testament authors as Scripture in the Bible. Okay? We see an example of this in 1 Timothy chapter 5. It says, For the Scripture says, You must not muzzle an ox to keep it from eating as it treads out the grain. That's from Deuteronomy. And then it says, So it says, For Scripture says, Then it says, And in another place, those who work deserve their, their pay. He's quoting Luke. Okay? So he's, they're equating... Timothy's equating Deuteronomy and Luke. The next thing is, authors put the New Testament writings on par with the Old Testament. 
Second Peter describes this. He says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable twist to their own destruction as they do other scriptures. Peter understood that Paul's writings are scripture. The authors of the New Testament recognized their writings as inspired by God. 1 Corinthians, Paul says, When we tell you these things, we do not use words that come from human wisdom. Instead, we speak words given to us by the Spirit, using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Paul in Ephesians says, As I briefly noted earlier, God himself revealed this mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal this to previous generations, but now his spirit has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. We understand the credibility of the Bible, right? Now, you might be a follower of Jesus and say, well, can't I be a follower of Jesus and not really stress Bible intake? Now, I should be able to do that, right? You've already told us that it's not, our salvation doesn't depend on it, so can't I do that? Well, Jesus expects us to continue to grow in our faith. The Bible says that all over the place, over and over. But Jesus actually speaks to us about how vital Bible intake is. In Luke, he said, but he said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And keep it, right? Retain it, live it. In John, he says, But now I am coming to you, and these things I will speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I had given them your word, as the world has hated them, because they are not of this world. Just as I am not of this world, I do not ask that you take them out of this world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth of your sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus is speaking to God the Father, and he's saying, make them more like me through your word. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in truth. Jesus is telling us we need to read the Bible. Jesus also promises Scripture is going to come after his resurrection. John 14 says, These things I've spoken to you while I'm still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. How would he do that? Bring to our remembrance by us reading the Bible. I don't know if you have are familiar with the term red-letter Christians. You guys know what red-letter Christians are? I don't think it's a derogatory term. I think it's descriptive, but if you're a red-letter Christian, I don't mean any offense. Some translations of the Bible have the words that Jesus spoke when he was on earth in red. And there are some people that believe that, that those are more important than other scripture. That Jesus said it on earth, and so those, those, we have, there's a hierarchy in the Bible to them. And so those should be weighed hev- more heavily than anything else. And I've heard people actually use red letters to argue against other things it says in the Bible, like, like it's a lesser thing. This is problematic theology, okay? And we'll see where it comes. Jesus dedicated Scripture to the Holy Spirit outside of those red letters. In John 16, it says, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority But whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And all that the Father has is mine, therefore I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. That's not the red letters. That's the rest of the Bible. The fact that Jesus dictates to the Holy Spirit what's to be written down, then the Holy Spirit dictates that to the biblical writers, right, who actually Pend it for us. In Mark, Jesus says, Have you not read this scripture? And then he goes on to quote from Psalms, The stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. Jesus assumed that his 
the hearers of who, who he was speaking to knew that scripture. He's, he, he, he's, he's, it's, it's being uh, almost sarcastic. Have you not heard this scripture before? Yes, they've heard that scripture before. Jesus put weight on the Old Testament in the same way they put the weight on the teachings of the New Testament. Jesus expected us all to know that verse. Now, all this being said, we should look at this com- between command and benefit. Right? Is, is Jesus commanding us to read scripture? No. He's encouraging us to read scripture. But let's look at the benefit of, of reading scripture. I don't think that Jesus and the apostles put stress the importance of knowing scripture because uh, it was going to make us more holy, right? More, more righteous, right? But they knew it was a way for us to become closer to Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, then he will sanctify us. Does that make sense? It's not, the, the purpose of it isn't to check a box and say, I read scripture, so I'm, I'm better than I was yesterday because I, I did this act. No, we're being sanctified through the word, so God is making us more righteous through that process. And if we claim to be followers of Jesus, then we probably should be interested in what that means. What does it mean? We say we're a Christian. We say we're a follower of, follower of Jesus. What does it mean? Doesn't it mean that we seek to value what he values? Doesn't it mean that we seek to speak like he does? Doesn't it mean that we seek to act like he does? Doesn't it mean that we want to think like he does? We want to be transformed. The great and wonderful news is Jesus wants to transform us. He does that primarily through the reading of the word. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You pray for sure, but you're reading the word. That by testing, you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Have you met people that have said, you know, maybe they're, they're wrestling with some topic and they're, and maybe they're Christian, maybe they're another uh, religion, and, you know, will say, well, how do you know that's true? And I go, well, I know it in my heart. It, 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 it's speaking to my heart. I have this burning in my heart. This is how I know this view is true because I, I feel it in my heart. Problematic. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The human heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked. I don't want to use that as my standard to judge. Mark 7, this is a red letter verse right here. For from within, out of a person's heart, comes evil thoughts and sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, Slander, pride, and foolishness. The heart is not a thing to use to discern, right? It's a very dangerous thing to use because our hearts get corrupted, right? We need to have an absolute standard, which is the word. The purpose of Scripture is not just to have information, right? That's what the scribes would have said. And it's not just to feel that you know more than the person sitting next to you in the row. That's what the Pharisees would do. The purpose of Scripture is so that we can be transformed, that we can be used. And again, it's the main tool that Jesus and the Holy, Spirit's, the Holy Spirit uses to do that. The Bible's importance to individual lives and the world at large cannot be overstated. It, it, it can't be. And I'm going to do something this morning that I don't think I've ever done in a sermon. I'm going to read you a passage out of a book. It's not a very long passage, but it's, it's a book called Speaking of Jesus by Carl Medarius. And it's one of the top five books that's affected my life in the last 10 years. And I'll give you a little bit of background for it. Carl is a missionary to the Middle East. He, he, he speaks fluent Arabic. And this setting for this story is that he is in Iraq in 2003 and he's in a hotel and he's dialoguing with some guys that are standing around that work at the hotel and and local folks and his purpose of going to Iraq was to tell people about Jesus and hand out the gospel of Luke in in Arabic and so when he's talking to these guys one of the hotel employees says you know what, what brings you here you with the military which 
would be logical, right? In 2003 in Iraq, everybody that was from America would have been affiliated with the, with the military some way. And he says, no, no, no. We're here because we understand Jesus is here and he's on the move. Now, at the time, I'm hoping it's changed since then. At the time, very, very few people knew anything really about Jesus. They understand Christianity and they understand it to be the same as conquerors. But the idea of who Jesus is, the truth about Jesus, they didn't know much. And so when he said, Jesus is here, the guy says, oh my. His hand shot up to his face. Let me tell you something. He went on, when I was a young boy, a man came through our city and he was telling us stories about Jesus to the people. The rest of the group and the hotel staff moved closer, listening intently. When this man left, he gave my father a cassette tape with recordings of stories of Jesus, the miracles and the teachings of Jesus, the people he talked to and how he lived. Wow, Carl said. Every night for 10 years, my father would play that tape to me and my brothers and sisters, and he played it until the tape did not work anymore. He stopped for a second and caught his breath. I love these stories of Jesus. I miss them. I've heard from my father and the old men of the city that there are books, sacred books, ancient books that tell the stories of Jesus as they happened by his friends. Is that true? Yes, Carl said. As a matter of fact, we've been, we've been giving them out all day. He almost fainted. I could see his face color, then pale, then color again. He was vibrating with excitement. Oh, please, he said as he gripped my hand. You must find one for me. You must give me one. I have to have one. All right, Carl said, and turned toward the elevator. I'll go see if I've got one left. I've edited this a little bit, but Carl already knew there weren't any there because they gave them all out already. But as literally God would have it, there was one under his bed that he didn't know was there. It says, I will never forget his face when I handed him a copy of the Gospel of Luke. With tears on his cheeks, he held it reverently, lifted it to his forehead, and closed his eyes. He lowered it to his lips and gave it a kiss, and then he slowly opened the book to look at the print. He lovingly ran his fingers over the pages and then bolted for the lobby desk. He picked up the phone, dialed rapidly, and spoke even faster. When he hung up, he looked at me and said, I had to call my father. He will know if these are the same stories of Jesus I heard before. We waited for a few minutes, and after some time, an aging Iraqi man showed up, gray beard and all. He looked at us a little suspiciously at first and made his way over to his son, who was literally popping up and down with excitement. Papa, he said, these men have come here because they are followers of Jesus. I told them about the stories of Jesus on the tape and asked them if they've heard of the writings of the stories, and they gave me one of them. The old man came closer, picked up the gospel, lifted it to his face, he read the title, thumbed through the pages, pausing to read here and there, and then he stopped. He lifted the book up to his lips and kissed it. Tears in the corners of his eyes. Yes, he said, this is it. These are the stories of Jesus. He wrung our hands, hugging us to his body, so grateful that he shook. This story convicts me. I have many copies of the Bible, all different kinds, different translations. I have chronological ones, I have illustrated ones, I have study ones. I have one written just for chaplains. I have one that's very old, I have one that's written in Mandarin, and one in Spanish. I've been around all manner of Bibles all my life, and I don't think I've ever kissed one. It embarrasses me that I don't hold the Bible seemingly in the same reverence that these guys do. They were so hungry, almost desperate for what I take for granted. How many people are there around the world that are that desperate to hear just a little bit about Jesus? Hundreds of thousands, millions, billions probably. The Bible is a fantastic gift to each of us from God. 
2 Timothy 3.6 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, and righteousness. It's a pretty amazing gift. So how did Jesus use it? He used it a lot. But you remember when he first, right before he started his ministry, he was tempted by Satan three times, right? Jesus had just come off, you remember, starving, didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights, and the first thing Satan does is tempt him with food. What does Jesus do? He quotes scripture to him. Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Live by, that's what we should be doing, living by the scriptures. Jesus relies, he's tempted three times. He responds to Satan each time with scripture. Satan actually misquotes him scripture out of context and Jesus, boom, ups him one, quotes him scripture. Jesus has memorized critical verses and uses it to battle temptation. What a great example for you and me. And all scripture is important because we don't know what our next challenge is going to be. Now, the Holy Spirit can do what he wants, when he wants, and how he wants. If you tell me that you're a follower of Jesus and then go lock yourself in the closet till you die, the Holy Spirit can get you and he can, he can sanctify you, absolutely. But if you're God and you write a book that is intended to equip your followers to transform the world, wouldn't you think he'd expect us to value that and to read it? I think claiming to be a follower of Jesus and not investing in the Bible would be if I got up here and said, you know what I want to be? I want to be a civil engineer. I really, really, really want to be a civil engineer. I want to build bridges. I want to build tall bridges and wide bridges. I want to build those crazy bridges that actually float. I want to build bridges. I want to be a civil engineer. But I refuse to read any books about chemistry or physics or statistics or mathematics, or geology. I just want to be an engineer. And if, and if the government wants me to be an engineer, engineer, they're going to have to bring that certificate and give it to me, because that's what I'm willing to do. That would be crazy, and we would want to stay off any bridges that I built, right? <laughs> that would be crazy, because I wouldn't know what I'm doing. I don't know what would be expected of a civil engineer. In the same way, if I don't read the Bible, I don't know what is expected of a follower of Jesus. We need to make every effort to add to our faith, right? Faith is a growth, growth process over the life of us being a Christian. First Peter in chapter one says, his divine power has given us everything we need for our godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through, the, through these things, he has given us very great and precious promises that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires right there should be enough for us to read the Bible. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. If each one of us that claim to follow Christ did that with the same determination that we do anything else that's important in our life, imagine how the world would be transformed. Imagine. All right. You're still here. Let's assume by now we've accepted the fact that the Bible is intricately attached to being a follower of Jesus. How do we go about ingesting it, right? And I know some of this is going to be very basic to some of us and uh, might be revolutionary to others. So bear with me. The first way, of course, is to read, right? We've got to read it. But the important thing is if you're starting out and you haven't really invested in the Bible, maybe it's been a long time since you've, you've read the Bible with any kind of Discipline, discipline in your life. What should you do? You should get a translation that speaks to you, right? There's, there's tons and tons of English translations, and um, 
some of them are going to relate better to you than others, right? Like the, the King James Bible, I love to hear that read. I don't like to use it to study because it has beautiful language, but it was written over 400 years ago, and I hardly ever say thee or thou, right? And so it, it kind of hangs me up when I'm trying to use that to study. There are, but there's lots of different translations, and some of them, some translations are word for word, some of them are thought for thought, and some of them are paraphrased. So you kind of go through those and kind of see what speaks best to you. In the notes, at the very bottom of the notes, I took one passage, and I have it in five different translations. So you can, you can look down there and kind of see, all right, I like this language, this one makes sense to me, that kind of helps. The next thing, if you're starting to study the Bible for the first time, to read the Bible in a real and vital way, is make goals for yourself, set a time. It's, I, it's like going to the gym, right? If you say, I'm going to go to the gym, and you don't go any further, you're probably not going to go to the gym. So say, all right, when am I going to read it every day? I'm going to read it with my coffee every morning. I'm going to read it um, when, I'm, you know, when I'm taking a break in the afternoon or before I go to bed. Set a time and come up with some plan. Now, Pastor Matt came up with this really cool plan of, uh, a few years ago called Smash Bible. And I think we have, yep, it's on our website. It's in the notes. And what he did is he, you can go through the, the Old Testament in a year and the New Testament in a year. And so he, he, he made up a sheet and it prints out just the amount you need to read for that day. And there's check boxes next to that. That's all really cool. But what makes it super cool is he came up with this system that you rate each verse for what it is. So is it a promise that we're to embrace or is it an example we're to follow or is it a command? You know, there's these, these five things. I think he added one more this year, six things. And then you take a highlighter, different color highlighter, and you highlight each one of those. Now, why this is great, at least it was great for me, because I've read through the Bible several times, you know, all the way through. But what will happen to me is I start seeing it as just the thing i got to do today. You know, and the same, i got to do so many push-ups, i got to read the Bible, i got to do, you know, walk the dog, all these things. And so I can read a passage, and I will forget what I read. I'll stop, and I've read a chapter, I forgot what I've read. What this does is it slows you down. So if I know that I've read a passage and nothing is highlighted, i got to go read it again. Right? And so then I go, you could just break it down. All right, what is this? Is this oh, this is a promise about Jesus. Oh, okay, well, that's yellow. I'm going to do that. Oh, no, 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 this is an example for me to follow. That's green. I'll do that. It's a great, great system. If you've never done it, I, I highly encourage it. And um, if you do this, it's 10 minutes of Bible reading a day. So check that out. Okay, so reading is one way. Hearing is the other way, right? You need to hear the word. You guys are here. You're hearing the word. Awesome. There's a podcast that you can hear the word. Um, there's a really cool thing called, it's, a, it's an app called YouVersion. It was written by a church, um, and they give it away. They've given it away. I looked last week. They, so far, they've given away 500 million times for free. It is an awesome app. It has all kinds of different translations. It has verse of the day, different study tips. But the really cool thing it'll do is it'll read the Bible to you. So you can go there, you can select a passage, you can hit play, it'll read it to you. So maybe your, your, your schedule's too tight, you can't read the Bible, but you can listen to it. You're on your commute, you can listen to the Bible. You're walking the dog, you listen to the Bible. You wake up in the middle of the night, you can't go back to sleep, put that on, put it under your pillow, listen to the Bible. That's a really, really cool free thing that you can use. By the way, God knew that understanding the Bible was going to be challenging for us sometimes. How do we know this? Paul in Ephesians 4 says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Why did he give them? To equip us to better understand the Bible. Read, hear, then study. Right? It's not enough just to read it and go on. You want to study it. Now there's, there's whole systems of how to study the Bible. I'm going to give you just the simplest one. It's just three steps. If you've never done it before. One is observation. What does the passage say? Read it. All right. What is the Bible saying? Two is interpretation. What does the passage mean? A little trickier. And then application. What do I do about what the passage says and means? That's the trickiest of all, right? What does it mean to me? What, what am I being called to do or to not do? Again, that is a very simple, simple narrowing down of how to study the Bible. There's a great classic book called How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth by Gordon Fee that I would encourage you to get if you're really starting to get serious about how you're going to study your Bible. And there's a link for that in the app. There's another really cool resource 
uh, that's free called the Blue Letter Bible, blueletterbible.org, and it's um, a website that has several different translations of the Bible on there, and then there's um, some, some study tips, and there's a concordance. You know, concordance is, if you want to know how many times dog appears in the Bible, you can put it in there. It'll show every verse where dog appears in the Bible. Okay? When I was young, back before the internet, for you youngsters, um, a concordance was about twice this thick, big thing like that, because you had to have every book, I mean, every word in the Bible cross-reference. Now it is awesome. You can just type it in there, boom, automatically goes there. The last thing that is a very, very cool tool is called Logos. It's logos.com. It is a Bible, Bible studying software that you have to buy. That's the bad news. It's awesome. Or the bad news is it costs. The, the good news is it's awesome. It's really powerful. They have different levels. So the, I looked this morning. The low, the low end tool is about 250 bucks. It goes way, way up. But what it does is, depending on what um, level you purchase, it links commentaries and other, other books. It links um, historical sermons. It'll link to maps. It'll, um, it has uh, Greek and Hebrew dictionaries. It has uh, a bunch of different encyclopedias of the Bible. It's really, really nice. Uh, but you just would have to go on there and kind of look. The, the middle of the road one's about $1,000. So it's not cheap, but um, if you can afford it, I would recommend it. It's really great. Okay, read, hear, study, memorize. Dun, dun, dun. Memorize the Bible. What? You're crazy with the memorizing the Bible. No, memorizing the Bible is great. Why? It equips us to live life, just like Jesus used it, right? And I know what everybody says. I can't memorize the Bible. Wrong. Uh, when I was involved with the Bible memory trip, I, you know, we, we had the kids memorize uh, the first three chapters of James, and if they've gone on once already, they had to, memorize five chapters of James and I can't tell you how many parents came to me and said well my kid can't do it because of X because it ha my kid has this number of been diagnosed with whatever I said well you know what he probably can't memorize dialogue but I'll bet he can memorize scripture because you know why God wants him to memorize scripture and there's something supernatural that happens I memorized it when I was 50 so it, that's the tip big tip for Bible memory, do it before you're 50. It's easier then, but you can always do it because God wants you to memorize scripture and he will help you, okay? So don't sell yourself short. This can be done. How do you go about doing it? Write down the scripture on a post-it note or a three by five card and put it someplace you're gonna come across it, right? On your computer to monitor, on your bathroom mirror. Um, I don't use the tachometer in most of my vehicles, so I would put it on my tachometer. I was not reading it. Don't go there. I was not reading it while I was driving. Somebody down here was thinking that? Nope. But when you're stopped at a stop sign, you know, you're trying to recite the verse, and you think, ah, oh, did I get that right? And you look down there, okay. That's a really, really great way to do it. I cannot tell you how often Scripture that I've memorized comes to my mind when I need it. I, it, it, is, it is supernatural. I am not kidding. The other great tip I would suggest for you is pick a verse or a passage that is, that'll help you in dealing with some challenge or sin or some issue in your life that'll make it that much more vital and motivate you more to do it, right? Pick one that, okay, if you're, if you're struggling with lack of faith, go to a verse that's dealing with lack of faith. You're, you're, you're struggling with kindness. You know, there's all kinds of verses that'll speak directly to those things and it'll really help you implement that and, and motivate you to memorize your scripture. Okay, read here, study, memorize. Then you want to meditate on this. Memorization is part of this, but it's really just bringing it to our mind. Like when, we're, when you're walking, when you're, you know, you're just sitting at home, you know, eating breakfast, you're thinking about this thing. Why? Because you're, you're ingesting it in a way that it's taking over. You're living it as you meditate. And then finally, apply it. It will do us no good if we don't apply it. We need to make sure that we're, we're measuring. We're using that standard. We're not using our heart. We're using scripture. We're meditating the stuff that we've ingested, right? And we're making that a priority. If we claim to follow Jesus, then we make Bible intake a priority. Will you pray with me?
Father, I pray that uh, each of us who claim to follow you would evaluate how we see this most precious gift you've left us. I pray that we would, we would have the enthusiasm and the passion and the longing for the word that these men in Iraq did. Not just to please you, but to grow us, to develop our faith in a way that nothing else we do will be as valuable. Lord, I know that there are people listening this morning that are not your followers and maybe have not devoted any time to your word. And I pray that you would move upon them, that you would encourage them to seek your word like these men did, that they would seek the gospel of Luke and you would bless them for that, that they would just invest a a couple of minutes a day for six weeks. You will transform them. You say that you will, you will. Uh, Father, thank you that you love us so much that you wrote this love story to us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand and sing with us one more time? my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree his body bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in joseph's tomb the entrance sealed by heavy stone messiah still and all
Amen. Go in peace.